Welcome to Oregon Voters Digest, the program that brings forward the social and political issues that are important to people living here in the Pacific Northwest. And now, your host, Bruce Broussard. Hi, this is legislative staffer and author Scott Jorgensen. I'm sure you've noticed that I'm not Bruce Broussard. It's true, I'm not. Bruce is actually out of town and uh, I was asked to come fill in for him and uh, honored to do so. Our guest today, over to my right here, is Caleb Knezovich. Glad to have you on, Caleb. So, Got my name Probably right. wondering, <laughs> who is this guy? Well, let me tell you, he's a student, he's a business owner and a community organizer. He's actually been uh, awarded recently for his activism and his student leadership. And that's involved uh, Portland Community College's District Student Leader of the Year for his efforts as District President of Portland Community College Students for Life. So really glad you could join us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Scott. Uh, one of the things I wanted to ask you about was what it takes to take on kind of a conservative issue mm. on a college campus. Mm. Because, you know, I, I went to Southern Oregon University down in Ashland, graduated a dozen or so years ago. And it was my experience that for as much as you hear about tolerance and diversity, that that's not the case. I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I was a I didn't even know I was all that conservative when I started going out there. And I was young and idealistic. And I was writing for the school paper. The college Republicans had just formed a club, so I went to do a story about them. And they baked a cake because it was Ronald Reagan's birthday. And they brought it out to the student commons area. And they, the girls that were in the club, left for a minute to go to the restroom. So I'm there by myself. I've got this cake. And people are just shooting these looks at me and I'm thinking well I'm not even in the club I'm not even a registered Republican I'm just a student reporter right here doing a story about this and the looks people are giving me like, but, but I've got cake come on <laughs> so I, I imagine I mean you're taking on what's a very divisive mm. issue and mm. has been for decades um, in an atmosphere that I, I imagine is uh, how do you how do you manage that well a lot of it is trial and error, but um, I've been on the PCC campus for two years now, um, and God's given me the opportunity to learn a lot of lessons. Um, I think, honestly, one of the biggest lessons I've learned, um, I was actually in Denver uh, a couple of weeks ago doing a training about this. Um, we live in a climate here in Oregon that is obviously not very conservative, especially in the Portland area. Um, and collegiate, you know, college campuses are generally pretty liberal. But even in red states. Yeah, even in red states, you know, it's that's kind of the, the territory. And one of the biggest things I've learned is you can't, you have to go in there with uh, an air of, of not compromising, but being willing to work with people who don't necessarily share your views. I, there's a story that I love to tell. Um, our second year, um, the first year we were on a new campus, um, the Sylvania campus of PCC, huh. and we decided that we would move in with kind of a, a strategy of trying to find middle ground with the administration and, and with um, the faculty and staff. And so we started something called the Pregnant on Campus Initiative, which is basically where we seek to provide um, baby clothes, childcare assistance, pretty much anything that a student who is pregnant or parenting could need to stay in college. Um, the numbers of community college students that are in college and parenting are huge. It's a different demographic than a four-year university, Correct. for example. Correct. You have people returning to school after long mm -hmm. absences. You have uh, parents a lot yeah. of times. Sure. And a lot of yeah. first-generation college students, many of whom are single parents. Um, and so we saw this need. And by the way, uh, we are continuing to do that. And if anyone in the audience is interested in finding out how you can help um, definitely contact the Voters Digest and they get you in contact with me and we would love to to tell people how they can be a part of this vital, vital um, impact on our community. But as we started this, you know, I, I went in thinking this is, you know, we're trying to help people. They're going to love us. You know, they're just going to love what we're doing. And uh, not exactly what happened. You know, we, we had some mixed responses. Um, some of which included direct opposition. Um, I remember very clearly sitting in uh, someone's office and them basically telling me that because I was pro-life I shouldn't have the right to help people um, and and so we we kind of looked at that very feminist very pro-choice agenda which didn't make a lot of sense because at the essence of what we do actually the pregnant on campus initiative 
was founded by the Feminists for Life of America. Really? Um, so it was it was strange that a feminist organization wasn't supporting what we were doing. But so we we go into this controversy and we're trying to figure out what do we do, um, how do we approach this, and we kind of had two options. The first option is let's fight this. Let's get some lawyers. Let's um, which we had access to, um, we could have done, and said, you guys are discriminating. You talk all about tolerance and, and respect, and you're not tolerating our views. You're not respecting our views. And so we had that option, and we considered that. And um, I was really happy. My, uh, my vice president and I had a conversation, and we were kind of talking about this, and she just said, you know, how much good are we going to be able to do tangibly to help women in the next year if we, if we take on this fight? And, and I'm not saying that's always the, a bad decision to make, but for us, we decided we're going to try to work with them for the next year. As we're opposed to let's just have a big shouting match right, here on exactly, campus or a lawn and courts and yeah. screaming headlines back and forth. And so that's what we did. And we started a program that I like to call um, Spread the Campus with Love. That's, that's kind of what we informally called it. And so we did diaper dries. We did, um, you know, Good, because those get chalk expensive. days, ice I, cream, I uh, ice cream dry. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. We actually had someone verbally threaten some of our members to hurt them during a diaper drive. So even doing that, it was, it was a little bit crazy. We're, you're spreading love and people are threatening you. <laughs> well, that's good. That's a very tactful approach. I like right. that. As opposed to just yelling and screaming back. And, and there was the, the story. We're just trying to up. help people over here. Come on. It, it was really cool because at the, kind of towards the end of the year, I participated in a, in a drama that actually the, the Feminist Women's Center on our campus was putting on. Uh, it was about sexual assault. I decided to be a part of it. It, looked, it was something I'm very passionate about. Um, and during that, I actually got to work with the woman who had, who had said some very um, inflammatory things about our group, about us. I got to work with her. I met her daughter. I saw her as a mother. I saw her as working to do what she thought could really make a difference in the world. And I feel like we gained an understanding of each other during that time. <laughs> we don't agree on almost anything still, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but we gained another understanding that both of us, in our own ways, are trying to do what we thought could be helpful to our campus community. And since that time, we have had a much more cordial relationship, and we've started working on things. We've got a really exciting program this next year where we're trying to help students with childcare on our campus. Trying to I was going to gonna ask about that. Yeah, yeah. We, we there's this really big idea that we're working on right now. And again, I would invite people if if you and the audience are interested in finding out more about how you can help, because there are tens of thousands of students at PCC, and so many of them are parents. And childcare is one of the biggest um, one of the biggest so needs. Going back to school. Yeah. Sure. And, and so we're working on how do we address that? We don't have all the answers yet. We have some ideas. Um, we have some different things we're working on with the administration and with the community to kind of create a partnership. We don't know exactly what that looks like yet, but um, it is something that's going to happen in the next year. Um, and, you know, yeah, we're going to continue to face opposition. But as we get out there and say, fine, we'll face opposition, we're going to go forward anyways. We're going to make friends. If we have to be hard about things, we'll be hard about it, but we are going to help people and nothing's going to stop us from doing that. Not opposition and not, you know, anything. And, and it's worked. It's worked so far. I will never forget there was a woman last year during that diaper drive who came up to us and she said, you know, I'm pregnant and my boyfriend um, is abusive and, and there was just a lot of things going on in her life and she didn't know what to do. And she was in school and she was trying to finish her degree. Um, and we said, hey, let's help you out. We were able to give her uh, you know, a place to stay at one point for, for a period of time. We were able to find her baby clothes and, and cribs and all kinds of different baby items. Are yeah, Because that stuff gets expensive, too. It, and it was incredible, yeah. you know? And the it, community, You spent a fortune on it, and then your kid grows out of it like two weeks later. Two weeks later, yeah. exactly. You just spent $5,000 <laughs> on you know, all this stuff. But it was incredible to see the community come together and help this person. And um, this summer her child was born um, and just being able to know that that life is there and and being able to be a part of her story was incredible and it makes everything worth it and if, if she was the only person we were able, able to help it was totally worth it and you could feel good about that yeah, exactly forward. and that's the work that we're doing that's the importance of it so are you finding that people are becoming more receptive over time because I think it's almost a generational thing. Mm, and yes. one of my longtime contentions is that, I mean, I was born in 1980 and, you know, Roe versus Wade was decided well before mm -hmm. that. 
and this discussion's been going on ever since, mm -hmm. and it seems like it's almost gridlock at times where people feel very strongly about it on both sides. But I feel that a lot of my friends grew up in broken homes, mm -hmm. and that has made them extremely determined to not do the same thing to their mm -hmm. kids. So what I yeah. do see is kind of a return of family values on some level among younger folks. Are you starting to see some of that too? Yeah, yeah. My generation sees the brokenness of our parents. They see the brokenness of the political structure, the social structures, the economic structures. Yeah, and this notion that the family, you know, don't rely on your family anymore, rely on the government. Well, we've seen the product of that yeah. for decades yeah. now. Yeah, and I think we realize that family is one of the most important things. And there, there are so many things that are changing. I mean, there's ultrasound technology that's changed so much of what people think about the unborn um and there's you know there is the brokenness that we've seen in our culture and people they see these these broken structures they see the the life of the unborn because that's really what the abortion debate is about you know we can talk about some very complicated very important issues like sexual assault and uh you know poverty and you know overpopulation you know, there's all these different discussions that people bring up but at the foundation, what the discussion of abortion really is, is, is the preborn a human being? If the preborn is a human being, then no excuse will allow for its life to be ended. If it isn't a human being, then no excuse is necessary. And I think young people are starting to realize that in greater and greater numbers. And we see that even at liberal institutions like Portland Community College. We see that across the state. We see that across the nation. I was in Denver and San Francisco and Washington, D.C. this year, you know, interfacing with young people. And all across the nation, we're seeing hundreds and thousands of young people rising up and saying, this is the issue of our generation that we have to address, and we have to address it right now. Um, it's just incredible to see that. Uh, that response from my generation. It's its frankly very encouraging. Well, and I think uh, one of the other things you see is the demand for it drops over time. And part of that is just contraception. You have True. more contraceptive options right now True. than you've had at yep. any point in human history. I would still like to see male contraception. I don't think that the onus should be entirely on the woman mm -hmm. when it comes to those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And I'd, I'd even like to see Oregon take the lead on that. Mm -hmm. We've got OHSU. I mean, we've got some research we could do. And I would really love to see that come about at some point. I mean, wouldn't it be great if the demand for abortion yes. was not there at all? Right, right. And, you know, and the, cut the risk of uh, unintended pregnancies. And there's so much clients. controversy, you know, uh, around how do we you know, reduce the need for abortion? How do we deal with this? How do we, you know, do all these things? And I think the important things that, you know, there are going to be people on the on the right side of the aisle that are going to say, we, we shouldn't talk about uh, contraception or sexual education. We shouldn't talk about anything. There are going to be people on the left side of the aisle who are going to say, we shouldn't talk about um, abstinence or, you know, adoption. We shouldn't talk. And I think the, the solution is, you know, at, at a certain point, we all have to make compromises. And we have to look at what is best for our society, what is best for the individuals in our society, and how do we find a solution that we can agree on? How do we work together? And that's really what we've done over the last couple of years at PCC. We've tried to find, okay, so I'm not going to agree with this certain group about this whole list of issues, but I am going to agree with them on this. Am I going to spend all of my time fighting them on those, or am I going to spend my time working with them on the issues that I can work on them with. I can tell you which of, which of those approaches works better in the legislature. Yeah, uh, yeah. And it's the collaborative one. Now, you hit upon adoption, and that's another thing mm -hmm. I wanted to mention here, because I think that, I, and I know this very lovely couple over there in Washington County, that uh, they want to be parents very badly. They've been going through the adoption process, and it's taken them at least a couple of years now. Mm -hmm. It's been really expensive. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I'd like to see happen is if we could find a way to streamline the adoption process, mm. make it easier for good people to mm. adopt children. Mm. Because it seems like it's a hindrance, and it's almost easier at this point to hop on a plane, go over to China, and, and mm. deal with the communist mm. Chinese government to adopt a child than it is to do it here at home. I, I think if you could do that, then you would expand people's options and, um, once again, lower the demand for abortion and encourage the creation and formation of families. You know, and I don't have the year, the, the numbers for this year exactly, but um, I have done quite a bit of research about adoption. And uh, last time I checked, there are millions of people in the U.S. who are interested in adopting who have not been able to adopt. And the last time I checked, those numbers were greater than 
the number of babies in the U.S. that were up for adoption. Um, and people say, where are all these babies going to go? Where are the babies, you know, where are these unwanted pregnancies going to go? And the answer is, they're already there. People already want these children. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, there are, you know, there have been millions of abortions, you know, over 55 million, you know, in the past, you know, 30 years. And it just, you know, thankfully it's on the decline, but still we see, I believe it's over a million abortions a year in the U.S. alone, um, which is really, it's, it's the largest, if you believe that the unborn is a human being, it is the single largest cause of death in the U.S. Um, out of, out of, you know, everything else. Um, and it's sad. It's sad to see that continue to go on. Um, and, and, uh, I'm glad to say that our, our generation is addressing that on a level that I don't think other generations have. What inspired your activism, especially on this particular issue? Mm. Because I found that a lot of people who approach things from the more conservative standpoint came from conservative families, had mm. a conservative upbringing. I mean, I did, but then I kind of freaked out for a few years as a teenager because my parents were way too strict. <laughs> right? I mean, there were these equally strict but compatible mm. forms of strictness. Mm. And then I came back around. Uh, hanging out in Ashland for four years certainly helped, right? <laughs> but I've also found that a lot of kids will come from that background and then go off to college and then find themselves flipped. Mm. So how, how did it come about for you? Yeah, and I, it's been a very interesting journey for me. I feel like I've come full, full circle maybe once or twice now. <laughs> um, I did grow up in a very conservative home. Um, I grew up in a home of um, parents who were very politically and involved in the pro-life um, cause even in the 80s and 90s before I was born um, and so growing up in that it was something that I that I cared about a lot um, but but like you mentioned um, I was kind of turned off by a lot of the things I saw in conservatism and my parents and um, I did kind of move away from that for for quite a bit of time um, junior high high school um, and it wasn't really till um, late high school that I started thinking about these things again and I, I came back not with everything that I had been taught as a child, but with many of the most important things. Um, I guess I would consider myself a, a hybrid conservative right now. I, I'm still figuring out a lot of what I believe um, about political and social issues, but there are a few core things that I know. Um, and, and one of the things that I really hope to see in my generation is I hope we keep an open mind because every generation, you know, young people tend to have uh, a little bit more of an open mind. You know, as you get older, you tend to concrete what you believe. <laughs> right, be stuck in your ways. Right. I'm not quite there yet, but I'm solidly <laughs> middle-aged by now, so I think I'm on my way. And I, I think there's a danger in, in what I see in, in young people today with how open-minded you are, but I think there's also a huge advantage. And I think that we can look at the issues and realize everyone has something positive to offer. How can we take the best of what everything and all the different ideologies, how can we take the good things and distill them into making America great and, and serving, serving one another? Because that's, that's what all of us want. I mean, whether you're, you know, young or old or white or black or Hispanic or Asian, I mean, whoever you are in this nation, a great majority of people genuinely want to have jobs and their children to have a bright future. And, and they want that for other people. Exactly. Too. And, and we just have to figure out how can we do that? How can we do that for other? Because it is possible. It's absolutely possible. But it takes a willingness to be humble and to look at the other side and say, you're a human just like me. You've had experiences just like me. And we may not agree on everything, but there is something we agree on. And we're going to use those similarities to work towards a solution. And if we all did that, there would be change. And I'm encouraged to say that in my generation, I see that at greater numbers than I've ever you know, seen reading through history. So I, I think we do have a bright future here. And, and I think that these things like abortion, we're going to solve these issues. We're not just going to abolish abortion. We're going to work on teen pregnancy. We're not just going to abolish abortion. We're going to work on on poverty and we're going to we're going to look at the things that contribute to abortion. We're going to address those issues as a nation and you know, from a political and a social aspect, these issues will be solved and I believe they'll be solved in my lifetime. Wow, that's a bold prediction there. <laughs> that, that's, uh, the, that's the motto of of my organization that I work with Students for Life of America, um abolishing abortion in our lifetime. Um, 
Now, this has been in the news a lot lately because mm. you've had these videos yeah. where right. people took undercover cameras into Planned Parenthood facilities, and I think that in a way it's changed the broader discussion, and politically, you always want to be on the offensive, mm. and conservatives a lot of times are on the defensive. Mm. Yeah. And anymore, the discussion that I see is Planned Parenthood starting their discussion with, we swear we're not breaking the law, and when you do that, <laughs> you're losing ground. Right. I mean, that, that's typically right. how that works. So. How do you feel that these videos have changed the discussion? Well, first of all, I'm going to I'm going to have a little rant about these videos because I I love what's been done and some of the things that people have said about these videos make me really mad. The the kind of the talking point that I've heard across the state across the nation is that these videos have been highly edited. Uh, I am a a video editor right. by trade. Oh. I own a company um, and one of the big things that we do and my one of my personal responsibilities is editing videos for clients. Okay, so I, I know a thing or two about video editing. These videos, yes, were edited. Every single video that you see on television, <laughs> in a movie, has been edited. The question is, has it been deceptively edited? Has it been changed? Have you rearranged sentences and given answers to questions that weren't asked? And the answer is no. Okay, you can go watch the full, completely unedited versions of these videos on YouTube. Uh, I was just looking and they continue to release almost weekly new videos and then the full footage of each segment that was in each of those videos. There's no hiding. There's no... That's exactly where I was going to go with that. You because know, I think to the extent that we've been able to use euphemisms, we've avoided talking about yes, what really exactly. happens here. And I think exactly. this literally peels back the veil. Yeah. So yeah. here's what's really going on. One of the other things I wanted to talk about is that... Uh, I'm going to have a busy work week next week, all right, because starting tomorrow we have committee days in the legislature. And this is something we do, this is relatively new in the last few years, is that institution kind of professionalizes. So we got done with the regular session back in early July. But anymore, the committees are still intact and legislators still meet every couple of months. And so that's going to be happening um, here in the next few days. In fact, this is where I do some shameless self-promotion. On Tuesday, uh, I'm going to be doing a book signing at the Capitol for my new book, uh, On the Cusp of Chaos. It's also available on Amazon.com. Pretty slick, right? Awesome. But anyway, uh, there was originally, as part of committee days, they had a hearing that was scheduled um, on this issue of Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. uh, that hearing has since been canceled. Huh. So uh, what is your take on that? Because it seemed like this was a good opportunity to encourage discussion of this issue yeah. given these controversies, but we're going to be now deprived of that discussion. There's a pretty obvious fact. Planned Parenthood never wins when people are talking about abortion. It's just the way it is. As long as it, you're talking about choice, as long right. as you're talking... Exactly. You know, I've recently been working on um, an advertising campaign with Students for Life of America, and I'm going to give myself one more plug. We are doing some market research right now, um, and if you're interested in being in any sort of market research about um, some advertising that's going to go out on a national level, again, contact the Voters Digest, and we would really love to get people's uh, help with this. It's something I'm personally uh, heading up right now in partnership with Students for Life. But um, one, of the, one of the things that I've done as part of this research is I've been watching Planned Parenthood videos day and night. You know, every piece of advertising they've ever put out, basically. They don't talk about abortion, like, ever. Like, if you just, if you knew nothing about Planned Parenthood and all you did was just watch their videos on YouTube, you would be hard pressed to even know they do abortions because they know what abortion is. I think deep down inside, everyone knows what abortion is. It is the ending of an unborn human life. And, and so Planned Parenthood doesn't win when we have committees talking about what they're doing. They don't win when we have videos coming out showing their true motives, how they're betraying women, how they're using minority communities to make a profit, how they're, you know, fulfilling many of these really uh, sickening objectives. And, and they don't win when we have committees talking about them. They, they don't win when people are thinking about what Planned Parenthood actually does. But I think one of the things this video has also done is bring up this issue where they say we do different women's health services, and, and they do, is that there are some that it's long been claimed that they do, mm -hmm. but it turns out that, well, really they don't. Like, like pap smears. I mean, it's this big thing that several really famous actresses have come out and said, you know, go to Planned Parenthood and get a pap smear. You couldn't even if you wanted do to. Pap right? smears. That, <laughs> they don't. In fact, I mean, we've been trying to expose this just even this week um, with some different events, but 
they don't do this. I mean, some of the, and, and I realize they do provide certain services, but they have quotas. We, we have documented that Planned Parenthood has abortion quotas. You know why? Because they make money off of abortion. And, and they make money off these things. You know, they don't make money off referring for adoptions. And, and, and so, so they're out here um, trying to, to promote themselves. And think about it. If you're, if you're doing something as unpopular as abortion, if you want to stay in business, it's, it's a prerogative for you to go out and, you know, make your best effort to try to put on a face of something else, to be a chameleon, to look like to the community that you're this awesome altruistic organization with completely, you know, humanitarian uh, objectives in mind. But then you watch these videos. And, and it's a completely different organization. They're talking about line items and buying Lamborghinis and how they can make money and as long so as they like make a profit. it's like the same kind you know? of thing that they accuse corporations of. Right, Like the right. same behavior. Now, here's the thing. I mean, even I, I would consider myself fairly socially liberal, right? But that's another part of the discussion I see happening here is people saying, look, I support Planned Parenthood. And, and the issue here, ultimately, at the federal level is funding for Planned Parenthood. And I say, okay, well... There's a difference between supporting an organization, which is to say you are free as a private individual to cut a check, to say, okay, if you support them, then here, cut the check. There's a big difference between saying yeah. I support Planned Parenthood on that level right. and being able to say I support forcing people who have a, you know, a deep moral objection to what mm. they do mm. to pay for it through their tax dollars. And I, you, know, you can make the same argument about people who are anti-war funding war, and it's just as valid. But... I think that's pretty superficial support if mm. your version of saying mm. I support it is insisting that people pay for it through their tax dollars. They say, you know, you can mm. put your money where your mouth is. If you support them, then you can support them. I, I want to give the viewers easy. a thought experiment. Okay. I, I cannot deny that Planned Parenthood does offer some services to women. I've, I've researched it. It's true. But I, I want to give viewers a thought experience that, that I think is helpful. Imagine if there was a preschool. Okay. This preschool had about 500 kids that came in every year. And once a year, they would kill two of the kids. Just randomly. They picked two of the kids out of 500 and just kill them. Okay. The other 498 kids received the best preschool education that you could get. And it was completely free. You know, this, this incredible educational experience where they went on and, and had the best education a preschooler could get. I guarantee you, you would not send your child to that preschool. And I guarantee you that preschool would not receive any government funding. That preschool would be shut down. Its administrators would be thrown in prison for murder. They would probably get a RICO charge. I mean, there'd be huge investigations. Nobody would be supporting this. And it doesn't matter what those 498 kids were doing. They were murdering two kids a year. And that's wrong. And on an institutional level, we shut things down that murder people. Okay? Yeah. Planned Parenthood does provide services to a lot of women. What are they doing at their heart? They're ending human lives. And are we going to give $500 million a year of our taxpayer dollars to an organization that's doing that? I think the simple answer is no. So we've got about one minute left in this segment. Uh, I understand Bill Diss is going to be yeah, on the show he's the a next great time guy. around. Wow. Someone who's given so much um, for what he believes, who's not been afraid to stand up for what's right, and has been a voice on so many different levels um, in our community. And, and uh, I know he's a great friend of this show, and I'm excited to see him on here next week. Um, I've had the chance to meet him. Uh, the first time I met him was actually in the hearing uh, with Portland Public Schools. I'm sure these viewers are familiar with his, his story, and uh, I think it's exciting to see him. I think he's going to be talking a little bit next week about these legislative days and, and how they've gone. So okay. definitely some of the viewers want to want to watch out for next week. If somebody wanted to know about your more about your organization, how could they find out? One of the great ways is emailing me at pccs, the number four, the letter L, at gmail.com. That's pccs4l at gmail.com. Um, you can go ahead and check us out on Facebook at facebook.com slash pccs4l. Um, and from there, you can contact me and ask me about any of the different projects or pro-life initiatives that we're working on. And if you just want to get more involved in the pro-life movement, I'm a great person to ask. I'd love to, to point people out to resources. Well, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Our guest for the first segment here was Caleb Knezovich, and he's with Portland Community College Students for Life. We're going to take a quick break, and we'll be back with my good friend, uh, attorney Tim Crowley. So we're really looking forward to that. We're going to be talking about some of the issues coming up uh, nationally. Uh, stay tuned. Thanks, Scott. Appreciate it. Yeah.
You are watching Oregon Voters Digest. This program can be seen again on these channels on these dates and times. Tell a friend. Hi, welcome back to Oregon Voters Digest. Uh, this is Scott Jorgensen, legislative staffer and author, filling in for Bruce Broussard, who's out of town. So we had Caleb Knezovich for the first half of the show with uh, Students for Life over at Portland Community College. Here for the second half, I'm joined by my friend Tim Crowley. He's an attorney and uh, he's a member of the Johnson Creek Watershed Council. Absolutely. Thank you, Scott. So one of the things I wanted to talk to you about, and this is something that I really wish more people here in Portland in the metro area would understand. Uh, you talk about sage grouse in eastern Oregon and they know exactly what you're talking about. The farmers and the ranchers and a lot of our agricultural interests are, have been freaking out about this for, for literally years. Uh, so it just came out that the sage grouse will not be listed as an endangered species. So I really wanted to talk about that and help some of the folks here in the city understand the ramifications of that. So. Is this a good thing for Oregon? Uh, certainly. I actually think that it's a good thing for both the public sector as well as the private sector. I think you know, this is one of the things that uh, concerned a lot of Eastern Oregonians. Uh, is, uh, the sage grouse is a, it is a bird species that it has uh, been in Oregon for some time now. It's, uh, it's considered actually a native species of Oregon. Uh, however, there is some there is some uh, uh, dis there has been some discussion as far as whether sage was even a part of the Oregon landscape originally. This is mm. this is information I came across while I was out visiting Eastern Oregon communities in my U.S. Senate ca campaign in 2014. Well, because people think of Oregon and they tend to think of the I-5 corridor and the coast and green and trees, but the fact of the matter is, geographically, most of Oregon is desert. There's no way around it. Certainly, <laughs> about and about uh, uh, you could you could take basically your your midline, which is the Cascade Mountain Range, east of east of the Cascade line, and it's pretty much all uh, high desert and and sage land, and and there is a uh, there is a a belief that it was actually originally grassland prior to the wagon trains coming over and mm -hmm. and actually being a. Uh, uh, a, a, a proponent of of spreading the, the sage seeds as they as they came westward. No, oh, okay. So it, there's some interesting. I've never heard that actually. Yeah, there's there's some very interesting elements with it. About uh, the sage grouse, uh, they they there's about 200 to 500 thousand sage grouse uh, nationally, and they occupy various different states. Oregon actually being less than seven percent of the population of sage grouse. Uh, Wyoming, which is where you have the predominant uh, number of of the species, uh, which occupies virtually the entire state, uh, and and Idaho, Utah, several states, Nevada, and a few states in between there. So, so it's Western United States mostly. Certainly, and specifically, it's there's so many different topics of conversation with regard to the sage grouse. Uh, we can start with the ranchers in particular who are very concerned that their ranching activities would be uh, would be interfered with if the species uh, which was on the candidate species list it was the candidate for be becoming an endangered species uh, by the US Department of Fish and Wildlife uh, that decision that was made on September 22nd was to take it off of the candidate species list. So it never made it to that extra step to the endangered species list, but actually uh, the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife decided it doesn't need to be on that list entirely. And there was a big sigh of relief collectively from agricultural interests. The Farm Bureau, the Cattlemen's Association, all these folks have been 
sending out press releases and Facebook posts saying, whew, okay, looks like we dodged a bullet here because I think they were aware of what that would have meant in terms of their ability to operate. And certainly in, this, in, the, in the process of scrutinizing whether this species was, uh, was endangered uh, or not, there was a, a, a very heavy emphasis on ranching and farming activities being placed on these entities by the government, by the federal government. Uh, whereas a lot of the threats to the species itself originated uh, with, for example, fire and uh, habitat loss through, uh, through invasive species, things of that nature, not necessarily through the ranching activities, which actually can promote the habitat of the species. Uh, for example, by reducing wildfire risks if you have animals grazing as I, opposed to letting the sagebrush and all this grow out of control. Certainly, yeah. absolutely. And there's a there's actually a company I was uh, associated with out in Colorado that deals with uh, deals principally with ranching activities that they would use uh, areas of land and they would corral the cattle into small areas and they would move this this corral as that land became worked up because it actually as the cattle uh, turn turn the land and are defecating, of course, on the land, they're they're actually uh, fertilizing it, okay. and they're they're providing a lot of opportunity for growth uh, in that particular area. So there's a lot of methodologies that are being used now by ranchers that are actually uh, that, for example, mimic, as this did, the buffalo of the plains, how they would actually contribute to the life cycle. That's interesting. One of the things, uh, because I, I attend meetings at the Association of Oregon Counties, because uh, my boss's district includes four different counties, uh, because it's a large rural district over in you know, southern and central Oregon. So we've got four sets of commissioners to keep an eye on and to, to in, engage with. And this issue came up quite a bit at that level. And I think one of the key points of discussion at the county level was that a lot of the development or potential development that could threaten the habitat of the sage grouse is limited anyway because of Oregon's strict land use laws, especially over there in, in eastern Oregon. I mean, it's different here in the city where you have the urban growth boundary and one can easily make the argument that housing is becoming unaffordable because we're deliberately restricting the amount of land that you can build on in the first place, right? But uh, I thought that was interesting when that came up that they said, Part of why we think we'll be able to convince them to not put this on the endangered species list is because they could say, hey, look, well, we're already you know, preserving their habitat as best we can over here. And I think that was part of the argument that was used to help keep it off of the endangered species list. Uh, certainly. And I, I would just add to that that, uh, that of the uh, sage grouse's habitat here in Oregon, 70 percent, 70, excuse me, 74 percent of that land is uh, managed by the federal government, either BLM or Forest Service. Or managed, depending on who you ask. And that was one of the things Precisely. I wanted to talk about here. Uh, this summer, we saw catastrophic wildfires all throughout Oregon. And um, I'm sensitive to that. You know, I'm from Southern Oregon. And I remember the Biscuit Fire back in 2002 burning half a million acres. And you hear folks try to say that wildfires are good for the environment. Now, I understand that Native Americans used to do burns here and there. They didn't burn half a million acres. You know, and it, it's bad for the environment. It's bad for air quality. It, it, it is very easy to see. And all summer long, I had friends down there posting pictures on Facebook. Couldn't even see the surrounding hillsides. Uh, and one of the biggest risks to sage grouse habitat is catastrophic wildfires. My boss was up in Montana and Wyoming for a bit in the summer, and he said it was just as bad there. There was one weekend where smoke had actually drifted here into the Willamette Valley, right? So Portland, Salem, and Eugene were getting a whiff of what the rest of the state had been through all summer. So that's one thing I really, really want people to know is that catastrophic wildfires are a, a huge risk to the habitat of the sage grouse. Yeah, and I certainly, I, I, you could take this, you could take this issue to so many different areas. I think one of the areas that th this issue does touch on is uh, exactly what you had mentioned with regard to uh, United States management of some of these regions. And, you know, you lock it up and let it burn is not management. You, you certainly you can look on the federal side and the the forest management that's happening for, uh, from that standpoint is is not necessarily the 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 the, the best uh, use of our resources as well as the best con conservation methods. Uh, 
I would argue, however, and, and this is this is well, you're an attorney, you argue, that's what you do, I get that. <laughs> this is this is very much from my work in terms of the Johnson Creek Watershed Council and what I've learned about about ecosystems and life cycles. Yeah. Uh, learning about what some of the private companies are doing to the land is sort of equal and opposite uh, uh, from a from a, a standpoint of management. I've seen devastation. My folks, uh, my folks live down in, in the Cottage Grove area oh, right. and uh, up in the foothills of the Cascades. And you you look at that kind of a practice, and that's just wiping everything out. I mean, there's there's I think that there's there's got to be some sort of a uh, is an interplay between the two. Um, and we just haven't reached that yet. A good, uh, a, a useful adoption of some of the conservation methods that, that the United States Forest Service are using, and as well as some of the harvesting methods that private companies are using, such as Weyerhaeuser. Another issue that's come up quite a bit at the county level is this issue of federal land transfers, because they say, you look at the eastern United States and even the Midwest, most of it's privately owned. You look at Oregon, you have counties that are going bankrupt where the federal government owns half of the county, if not more, and they don't have any tax base. Uh, between the federal ownership and the land use restrictions, uh, they, they don't have much to work with and never have. It, you can say, oh, well, they, they just need to pay more taxes, but that, that doesn't, that's not really what's going on. There's more to it than that, especially when your population is people, you know, elderly people on fixed incomes, right? So, yeah, it's the federal land transfer issue is interesting and it's fairly complicated, right? There's a lot of different factors involved there. There certainly are, and and I think actually that the uh, that the biggest problem with the federal government controlling and I'd say just cordoning off large swaths of land is that these communities, as you mentioned, are they they become dependent upon the federal government for subsidies, subsidies for education, subsidies for infrastructure. Uh, so essentially, you have you have a, a a large number of communities that subsist largely on a handout from the federal government. That creates a dependency, and that's the kind of dependency that we need to get away from here in our society. It is a big problem in a lot of different areas. So we could talk about the 1937 Federal ONC Act, which mandated that you have these lands all throughout Western Oregon, and elsewhere too, but it had, you know, largely in Western Oregon, and they were set aside for sustained yield harvest. And the federal government got a cut of that, the local governments got a cut of that, and everyone was happy. Then you had this whole spotted owl issue coming up, and so they said, all right, what we'll do is we will pay the counties to not harvest timber. We'll pay them instead of that. And that kept social services intact, you know, sheriff's office patrols and libraries and things like that. But now it's a battle every couple of years because you have to get it reauthorized. And meanwhile, the private sector continues to struggle and you still don't have a tax base there. And I'm so glad that you brought up uh, one thing in particular, which is the spotted owl, because I think it's a, a great, uh, uh, yeah, another sort of tributary to our discussion of the sage grouse. Here's a species that uh, was, seen, was put on the endangered species list by the U.S. Department of Fish and Wildlife. And it, was, it became a huge, a major uh, roadblock for for the lumber industry here in Oregon uh, to to harvest timber and essentially what you saw during the 80s and 90s was a scale back a major scale back of of timber production and because of uh, the mandates to protect the spotted owl now what they found was that it wasn't necessarily the logging that was uh, that was causing the the habitat loss. It was again, once again, fire was a major issue. Still is. Uh, and and our friends from the east Co coast, a, a species called the barred owl, which mm -hmm. had had been pushed out of uh, uh, densely populated areas of the east coast and had migrated its way west to begin to uh, uh, take over some of the areas. It's a much bigger bird. It would uh, prey upon either the same. Uh, animals, or actually, sometimes spotted owls themselves, and so it was. And a, sometimes they breed with them too, right? So you precisely. got like this whole combination of things there. So the biggest threat to the spotted owl, spotted owl, wasn't logging per se, but another owl, and once again, habitat being damaged and destroyed by catastrophic wildfires. And so you you see this you see this as a trend, I think, with the with the federal government in in its in its management of the ecosystem and the life cycle, and how that they have tried to tinker with every little aspect of every little species. And what we've noticed is that oftentimes they're getting the the issue wrong, 
<laughs> and and in tinkering like this, you're throwing off the cycle completely. And so uh, another another example of that would be the um, would would be the cormorants. At the and I've worked on this issue at the state level. So we have these hatcheries and. They're not inexpensive. I remember doing a story about one when I was working over at the Estacada News and went and visited the, the fish hatchery back there and you start to kind of add up and say, this is easily a multi-million dollar operation. And so we have this issue where the, we have these hatcheries producing all these fish and then you've got these cormorants just kind of hanging out, just eating the fish. And you're saying, well, okay, so we're paying a fortune to feed these cormorants. Certainly, and now we we actually find that the, the Columbia River is such an interesting body of water because it actually was at one point uh, a it supported a, a salmon and steelhead population of uh, ten to sixteen million. Oh wow! Now that's down to one point five million, uh, and the reason it was reduced so much was not because of the cormorant pop population or anything else, but actually because of the 200 plus dams that were built along the system, the waterway, during the be between 1930 and 1970. And so you have these dams, and the first dam that was built, just imagine 16 million fish all hammering right into the dam, not knowing where to go anymore. You, of course you're going to see a major die-off, but we've built successive ones. And yes, there was attempt to mitigate some of these factors with fish ladders and things like this, but at this point, there's so much tinkering going on, you're, you're not going to be able to necessarily recover from that. We wouldn't recognize a natural balance even if we had it. And one of the other examples we had talked about, uh, because I do pre-interview, by the way, it helps these things go much more smoothly, and we're friends, and we, we talk all the time anyway. Um, over in Bonneville, you had this situation where you had endangered sea lions eating endangered fish. Right? And so they felt that they had to get involved. And if I remember right, they went and tried to scare the sea lions away. And the sea lion, it was basically a buffet for them, right? Like, I'm just going to hang out right here and eat the fish. I don't have to do anything. They come to me, right? Absolutely. And, and you know, that's, that's just, I think it all really boils down to what is the best use of our resources? We certainly have limited resources when it comes to our public spending and our government. And now, that, that could be argued with as well with, with policies that the Federal Reserve has taken and congressional spending in co combination. Yeah. However... But we print money and we're still broke. <laughs> precisely. And, we, and I think that it's, it's really does... What we have to do is we really have to focus on where our largest priorities are, pick several of those top priorities, and do them well. Don't, don't try to, to uh, spread ourselves too thin and I think the life cycle is one of those good places for, for local economies, even state, uh, state uh, excuse me, local governments, and even <laughs> state governments to get involved with. But I think we see the federal government tripping over themselves uh, re reoccurringly because of uh, a lack of knowledge of the local uh, ecosystem and the local life cycle and, and how human beings are interacting with that cycle. Uh, and we see uh, a, a desire to promulgate itself, a, almost a creation of a problem so that they can go and deal with it. Uh, I, I say a great example of that would be, I can't remember the name of it, but it was a river in Colorado. And our conversation was, got me thinking about it, where the EPA went in and actually had uh, bored a hole in a mining shaft causing a massive uh, a spill of, of toxic chemicals. If I remember chemicals. right, the owner of that mine didn't want the EPA there. And the EPA insisted and said, we're going to come on, we're going to take legal action, we must get in there, and then caused a spill to where if a private individual did that, if a private company did that, uh, they would make an example out of them, publicly. Certainly. And I, and I think that, I think that there, is, there is a room for the federal government in certain areas. I think, as I mentioned uh, in our talking with each other, oh, national the, defense. Yeah, the, well, the Clean Air Act sure. is one of those was one of those examples. No one can argue that the Clean Air Act did not clean up Los Angeles. I mean, I noticed that over my own lifetime and going down there. I have a lot of family members mm -hmm. from there, and I I remember getting sick from the air quality there. And over the course of of a, a few decades. I, I now can go down there and I'm, I'm, I smell the air. I was like, well, this is much better than it was when I was growing up. Yeah, and I grew up in Southern California, too. I remember the smog would creep down to Corona. It was already over Ontario, but the last few times I've been down there, it's been 
gorgeous, actually. Now, with the your work on the Johnson Creek watershed, if I remember right, I've been reading some news stories over the years that say we have coyotes. There's coyotes hanging out in southeast Portland. So uh, they are actually coming from Powell Butte is is one of the areas that a lot of the coyotes are coming from. Not, not, they're not hitchhiking though, right? <laughs> because that, that's a long way to go. Well, you know, there's actually a neighborhood watch for coyotes uh, <laughs> happening right now, and 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 uh, I think a lot of it stems from uh, protection of folks' cats and dogs and domestic animals that folks have a, around the house. Uh, coyotes have been known to. That's uh, right. So if you wonder where your cat went. That might be a, a good oh, guess, man. yes. Yeah, so uh, the coyotes have been they're certainly making a, a major comeback in the area with some of these protected areas. Uh, beavers are another uh, species that we've seen along oh, the... I'm nowhere near as afraid of them as I am coyotes, though. <laughs> I, I'm fine with beavers being around. Be beavers can build their dams and hang out, but I, I start to hear coyotes, and oh, we've got young kids, right? And Absolutely. And so you think about something like that, where you have a kid playing in the neighborhood or even your dog people get really attached to their dogs and knowing that you've got coyotes running around what are some of the things that you guys are working on as part of the watershed council and you mentioned about the neighborhood watch not for people on methamphetamines or criminals or anything of the sort but for coyotes we have a coyote neighborhood watch well you know i that's a good question i'm not sure that uh that the johnson creek watershed council has taken that element into consideration yet something i might bring to the to the council uh it's a very interesting perspective that they've taken uh it, it is a non-profit organization so it's not a government entity but they do partner with uh with portland parks and recreation all the time a lot of their work focuses around uh, basic uh, aspects of the creek which is just simply cleanup in fact we just did a cleanup on i believe it was august 28th uh where where you're wading through chest deep water and you're literally pulling out I mean, one of the biggest problems with the vagrants and, and the people in the area, the homeless population in the area, is they just dump things there. And uh, and it's not just that population either. It's it's sure. folks driving by that just literally get rid of their trash right around the, the creek. And these are, these are common problems with urban uh, water sources. So uh, so we just walked through the river and, and pulled out a lot of the uh, large debris, even the small debris. And, you know, once a year we do this. And actually what the neat part about it, and it's one of those non-political issues, is this is just a, a good thing to do. You go through, and we've seen over each year successively less and less trash having to be pulled out. So that, no, that does say something, that, we do, that we're making some progress in actually reducing the amount of trash that's in the system altogether. So... We're dealing with that element of it. Uh, there's a broader philosophy, and, and the Johnson Creek Watershed Council's work has a lot, a lot to do with uh, trying to take back some of the land, purchasing it through private acquisition, uh, to, to give it back its flood floodplain. And I think that's actually a very interesting to aspect. Yeah, it seems like a win-win thing, right? Because as a property owner, you don't necessarily want the liability when you've got a 100-year flood event, uh, dealing with insurance, having to rebuild your property. Uh, so, okay, a win-win situation where you have more buffers and uh, you kind of preserve the stream as it is and you're not trampling on somebody's private property rights in the process. Precisely. And that's, and that's really it. And you can, you can bring that, that, that uh, particular creek back to a state of its, its, its natural existence. It's, it can breathe again, which I think that that's a lot of the problem is that we've We've, uh, you know, river, rivers, just like a lot of different uh, elements in nature, are a, an organism. They have to be able to, to function, to breathe, to be able to flow, just like our heart pumps blood through it and into our fingers and into our toes. It's, it's, a, uh, it's a matter of, uh, of, of a cycle. And so, so when, you're, when, you, when we free up that river, we've seen a lot of we're, in fact, we're getting. There has been efforts to remove a lot of the barriers that have impeded that creek. Uh, we've we've seen a lot of recovery in terms of fish species, in terms of frog species, and ultimately you end up creating a a, a healthier ecosystem because there have been more uh, elements uh, cr uh, infused and um, and uh, and enlivened because of that. So. So you mentioned earlier that you'd run for the U.S. Senate a couple of years back in, in the 2014 cycle. Um, I heard rumors that you might be considering 
to run for House District 48 over in that area? Well, I've considered it, uh, Scott. I've, I've definitely um, I've thought a lot about it. I've certainly I've talked to a lot of neighbor neighbors, folks who are concerned in the district, and and uh, you know I think you could you could generally say the district itself covers uh, essentially from Powell Street south. Uh, and so Powell Street's the northern border. In the southern border, it kind of carves around Happy Valley and into Oatfield Unincorporated. And uh, on either side, from east to west, is about 64th Avenue to 136th Avenue. So, so you, parts of it are in Clackamas County. Right? Parts of it are in Clackamas way. County. Uh, and and we, we we're seeing. I'm I'm generally seeing a trend uh, of folks who are. Uh, who are tired of of local government ignoring them? I think that's a particular issue for East Portland. Oh, the sidewalks and the infrastructure. Lack of basic infrastructure for folks. Uh, there's there's also a concern about education. Uh, we've we've seen uh, actually in recent news the uh, corporate kicker being diver diverted to the general fund rather than going to uh, education educational output. So there's some issues with regard to folks who are concerned about education not getting a fair uh, share of its uh, of its of, of its efforts. And uh, I think you you see also a lot of issues with. You know, small business owners in the area who are uh, laden down with a lot of the the uh, bur the tax burden in the area, and that in particular is I think of of grave concern to grave concern to everyone in the district. What I've noticed is income inequality being a primary issue on people in people's minds. So if you do end up running, uh, you're going to let me know, right? Says the buddy. <laughs> Absolutely, of course I would. Good. Well, thanks for joining us. My guest, Tim Crowley. Uh, this is Scott Jorgensen signing off. Oregon Voter Digest. If you need more information, please visit www.oregonvoterdigest.com. Thank you so much for joining us. It's good to have you on. Thank you, Scott.